and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Just so you know, uh, some housekeeping rules. Um, as we like to say, um, Elvis has left the building, but in this case, our Lord has left the building. So he's in the back, so no need to genuflect. And, you know, I know there's a stoicism in, associated with certain parishes. You are free to laugh, okay? And, um, we pur purposely moved the Blessed Sacrament because um, we wanted to use this space um, for a variety of reasons, um, a little bit more comfortable than being in Mary's Hall. Um, Margie is handing out this handout. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I've just gotten so sick and tired of PowerPoints that I just decided to go old school with a little handout. Plus, you can take this home. And also, if you ever want to go back to it, um, you have a reference, okay? So if you, um, the parish is recording this talk, I believe, and then it'll be posted to the uh, website. Okay, that sounds correct. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so um, I'm going to speak about this book, The Five Love Languages. How many by show of hands have read this book? Okay, well, about a third of you, or a little less than a third of you. Okay, and I'm going to explain to you the premise of the book and why I think it can be useful. This is a book I've actually used in marriage preparation. Right? But I have to say that it's also very relevant for any number of relationships beyond marriage. I mean, you could think about your relationship with a parent or with an adult child or with a grandchild, and this would apply. Now, the author of this book in this series is a guy named Gary Chapman, who's a Protestant minister. And uh, he actually, because of the popularity of this book, morphed it into, like, you know, the five love languages for pet owners, okay? And then within pet owners, you know, I mean, I'm almost positive at this point, he's got, you know, five love languages for parakeet owners, you know, kind of thing. Okay, so, I mean, he, he saw a good thing and he said, hey, I can make lots of Monet, let's do this, okay? So this book has become a real popular book. Now, if you haven't read the book, I recommend it. I will tell you up front, I don't get any kickbacks whatsoever for speaking on, uh, about the book. Um, but I've, used, I've found it to be very, very useful. Um, in fact, um, when I've talked to couples who are having difficulties in their marriage, um, this is kind of one of the tasks I put them on because, it, as it turns out, um, a lot of the misunderstandings that occur in their marriages, I've found, um, are not because either or both of the spouses don't love the other person, but they don't realize that the other person is telling them, I love you, and they don't even hear the words or understand what they're saying. Okay, so the book has, I think, some traction. Now, the other thing, too, that I perhaps um, has motivated this talk in some sense is the COVID experience. Uh, some of you have been, have been spending inordinate or disproportionate amount of times with your spouse or other loved ones or loved ones that are difficult to love, okay, or, or all, all of the above. So perhaps um, I know a lot of relationships have been strained because of COVID because you're used to, in many cases, having sort of a buffer of most of the day not together, and then suddenly, you know, it's almost like the equivalent of the um, retired man who is now home full-time, and the wife who's been home for years, she's like, what are you doing here? Okay, like, you like, need to go and do something. I actually ran into a man once on the Camino in 2018 um, I was walking with a group. We did about 120 miles starting east of Santiago de Compostela, and we walked west for six days. And I met a guy probably at the second day in, and I said to him, uh, he heard my accent, and he says, oh, you sound like an American. I said, I'm, I am. And he says, uh, I said, where are you from? And he says, the Bay Area. And I said, I used to live in the Bay Area and teach there. And, you know, we had a lot of common, um, you know, places and things um, to talk about. But then I asked him, how long have you been on the Camino? Because he looked really, really ragged. And he says, six months. I said, six months? And I said, where did you start? He said, Prague. And I said, wow. I said, do uh, you have a family? He says, yeah. And I said, wife? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you've been gone? How, how long have you been away? Five months and three weeks. This is the last month. I said, 
why have you been away so long? He goes, oh, my wife picked me out. He uh, cashed out on a dot-com startup, and he was now at home. He retired at the age of 47, didn't know what to do with himself, and he was kind of driving his wife crazy. She says, get out and don't come back until you figure out what's next. Okay. So if you kind of use that as sort of a microcosm, some people are not used to being around each other, so I think that the COVID experience perhaps has kind of brought that home a little bit. Okay, so before I get into the five love languages itself, um, I do want to talk here on the handout about um, three myths about marriage that need to be demystified. And um, before I get into anything further, just so you know, I'm going to talk for a little less than an hour, I hope. And at any point during the talk, you need to leave. Fine, I, I won't be offended. Okay, I know people have kids that are need to be picked up and different. Things. That's fine, uh, but I'm going to hold all the questions till the end. Okay, because I want to get through the handout and then we can go back. So if there's anything you want to ask me about, jot it down. That's why you have a piece of paper, and then ask me in the end. Okay, all right. So let's go through some of these myths about marriage that need to be demystified. Again, I'm talking about this from the perspective of marriage preparation, but those of you who've been married for a number of years probably have come to realize this in your own lives. Um, the first is the idea of you complete me versus you compliment me, okay? Many of you are familiar with this very famous or infamous line from the movie Jerry Maguire, where Tom Cruise, in expressing his love for Renee Zellweger, says, you complete me. Okay, that's baloney. Okay, and, that's, and let me tell you why theologically that's impossible. No human person can complete another human person. You know why that is? It's because the human person is capable of imagining the infinite. And the other human person, their spouse, is finite. The number one killer of marriages is unrealistic expectations of the other person. So if you're expecting your spouse to complete you, you're in for a big disappointment. Those of you who've been married a number of years know exactly what I mean, okay? I mean, one of the great things about marriage, of course, is that your spouse hopefully has brought you some of your greatest joys, but you're also quite aware that they're also quite capable of bringing your greatest sorrows, okay? It's two sides of the same coin. So complementarity is different than being completed by the other person. So to say that you to have the expectation that your spouse completes you, you are setting yourself up for a huge disappointment. In fact, I've talked to many couples who've been married 20, 30 years, and they're still waiting for their spouse to complete them. And I figured, you know, at this point, like, didn't you figure it out? Like, you know, they are who they are at this point, right? I mean, okay. I mean, maybe they'll make nominal adjustments, but fundamentally, who you married is who you married, fundamentally, okay? All right. The second thing is physical touch is enough for men. This is a big myth that women have. If I keep the mister happy, all is good. That's actually another big myth. Men need more, a lot more, in terms of love than just merely physical touch, okay? The two most important things for men are their work and their ideas. If a man is not respected by his wife for his work or his ideas, there is going to be a huge gap there. Right? So, and what does the man want to do? Right? He wants to provide for his family. That's why unemployment is such a huge crushing blow, especially for men. It's not just about not being able to sustain a certain lifestyle, but it's actually deeper than that, right? It's this emasculation that occurs because the male is unable to do what he's actually programmed to do, which is to provide for his wife and his children, right? So again, I say to the women here, and even if it's not, we're talking about your spouse, maybe it's your son, and you're, you know that your son and your daughter-in-law are having difficulties in their marriage or things like that. Keep in mind, physical touch, while very important to men, is not enough. They need to know that their ideas and their work matter to the people closest to them. Okay, so let's get into the five love languages itself. 
all right? And you can refer back to your, um, oh, I'm sorry, there was one more myth. There are only two rings in marriage. Everybody knows the third ring, right? Suffering. Okay. That's the third ring of marriage, suffering. Okay. And that's, that's the most perduring one. I mean, this is actually, in a way, the mystery of marriage is that because, you know, none of us can escape the inevitable sufferings that come in life. I mean, I don't care how good you think you have it, you can still die. And you will still die. And at some point, most of us get sick before that happens. And you can try to push it off or try to create this world around you that sort of seems to at least stave it off on some level. But no one has overcome human death except Lord Je the Lord Jesus. But yet, remember, you know, this is kind of the paradox of the Christian life. Everybody wants to get to heaven, ostensibly, but I doubt anyone in this room is in a particular hurry to do that tonight. Right? Everyone's like, well, that's a good long-term thing. Okay, but not, not today. I've got lots of other things to accomplish. So one of the mysteries of marriage is that, you know, fundamentally you're grounded in a relationship where you actually choose to accompany another person and be accompanied by another person with the prospect of suffering with each other and for each other, right? Making those sacrifices, right? So, you know, whatever the sacrifices may be, because of your fundamental position of love towards the other person, it's worth it. You're happy to make the, the sacrifice because you love the other person, okay? So let's get into the uh, five love languages themselves. Here they are. Now, they should be fairly self-explanatory. If you, if you don't know what any of these things mean, um, I'll allow a question at this point, okay? Physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, gift giving, and acts of service. Is that pretty... It's that all very, this should be pretty self-explanatory, okay? Chapman writes in very, very plain language. Now, just so you know, in this book, the way this is worked out is that he spends each chapter talking about each of the love languages, and then at the end of the book, he actually has a, um, a test, like an exam, all right? So what I want you to think about is this. I want you to think about this on two levels, and you can think about it in terms of your spouse, you can think of it in terms of a child, okay, whatever. Everybody has a primary love language and a secondary love language, all right? Uh, akin to a college major or minor, right? So what that means is, on one level, there is a major way you like to express love, okay? And there's a minor way you like to express love. So for instance, I know for myself, I'm a gift giver. That's my number one way of telling people I love them, okay? Now, you know, there's some people who really are into that because I give, give good gifts, okay? I have no dependents, and I'm thankfully in a position to give nice gifts, okay? But for me, like bringing a gift or giving a gift, and I usually try to think these things out, okay? is very important to me. So I like to tell people I love them by giving them a gift, okay? Now, my secondary probably would be quality time. I will give you my time. I will listen to you, I will sit with you, I will talk with you. You know, it could be hours on the phone, for instance, okay? That's my major and my minor. But remember, just as much as I like to show love, there's also a primary and a secondary way I like to receive love. Okay? So, for instance, one of my big things is words of affirmation. It's important to, for me to hear people say that they appreciate what I'm doing for them. Okay? Now, I'm partly Latino and partly Filipino. We're a very touchy culture, so my secondary love language is physical touch because we were always, I mean, my family were always hugging and kissing. Okay? And those of you who are from those kinds of cultures, you know what I mean. All right? It's kind of strange, though, because, you know, I've lived with a lot of, um, oh, Dutch-Irish pastors like yours, okay, very stoic, you know, and, you know, I would serve the Latino community, and he'd just be like, you know, mind-blown because, you know, 
I mean, those of you who are familiar with Latino, it's just, it's a very, very, um, I, don't, I don't want to just merely call it a sensual culture, but it's a very tactile culture. That's why I joke that Italy and Spain were the worst two countries hit by COVID. Because Italians and Hispanic, they, Spaniards, they can't stay away from each other. They, they can't, they, social distancing is so against their DNA. Okay, all right. So, all right, so what I like to think about is that there's also the fact that there are many dialects in love languages, right? So for instance, within your primary love language, there might be a, a secondary love language even within your primary, okay? So most of us are pretty complicated, but it's a good thing to think about. If I had my druthers about how someone would show love towards me, what's my primary and what's my secondary? Second question, when I show love, what's my primary and what's my secondary? Okay, now here's the thing. I talked about gift giving okay, as my primary way. Most gift givers I know, myself included, we do not like to receive gifts. Okay, we like to recycle. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, <laughs> but, okay. but we don't like to receive gifts. Because gift givers don't like to be outdone, right? It's like saying, I love you, and they're like, oh yeah, I love you more. Hmm. Okay. You gave me $50 to Amazon, here's 100 and back and forth, right? I don't like competition, okay? So think about that. Just because you like to show love in one way doesn't necessarily mean that you like to receive love in the exact same way back. These are not one for one. Okay, now this is a great exercise to do just by yourself, but think about every single one of your children. Think about every single one of your grandchildren. Extended family, okay? Because think about it, it could actually revolutionize the way you do gifts. Maybe the gift that you give them for ber their birthday is not actually a gift card. Maybe you're gonna do an errand for them, or you're gonna, you know, you're gonna spend, or you're gonna spend time with them. I mean, that's maybe what they prefer, okay? And this, why is this so important? And I'll, I'll just give you an example, okay? One time, a couple came to me, this is in one of my former parishes, back when I was doing parish work, and um, they were really struggling. And it turned out that, they, that what they were really struggling with, ultimately, is that they just didn't know each other's love languages. I know that sounds trite, but it was really what was happening. So I asked that I had them both in my office, and I said, okay, well, give me an example where you feel like your wheels are spinning and you're frustrated. And uh, the groom says, Father, I was driving home from work, and I saw, you know, a dozen roses for $10. And I said, oh, cool. So I pull over, and I get the roses. Okay. So I bring them home. I put them in a vase, put them on the, on the kitchen counter, and my wife walked in the room, and he said, honey... I, thought, I saw these today and I thought of you. You know what her response was? Why are you wasting money? That's what she said. Why are you wasting money? I'd rather you fix the sink. Okay? All right, now, I think most balanced persons would say, thank you. And she might have said, thank you, fix the sink. You see what it is? She wanted acts of service. She, to her, her husband loving her is acts of service. And they were like this. They were actually interested in loving each other, but they didn't even know how. So he brings the, the, the roses, and she's upset that money was spent, okay, because she's a bit miserly, all right? And second of all, the, the, the sink's still broken. Sink's still leaking. And in her mind, her primary love language of reception is acts of service. His primary love of language of giving is gift giving. They're all saying I love you all over the place, but they didn't even know. So I forced them to do this, and they're much better now. Now here's the hard thing. Let's say you like to be a gift giver like the gentleman I just talked about, okay? He wanted to give the gift of the roses. But now he knows what she prefers is acts of service. Here's the trick. 
you have to make the adjustment in favor of the person who's receiving the love. Even though I'd prefer to give gifts, this person prefers I fix the faucet. See? Because in a self-centered world, all I want to do is what I'm comfortable doing. All I want to do is give gifts, but that's not really how they feel loved. So you have to know, I mean, look, I'm giving a talk right now. What's the number one rule of public speaking? Know your audience. It's the same thing in marriage. What's the number one rule of successful marriage? Know your spouse. Because you know how to push their buttons, right? You know things you don't bring up. You also know questions you don't ask. Honey, does this make me look fat? Get okay, unfair, like uncool. I said, next time a friend of mine asked me, he said, my wife asked me, like, you know, she had just given birth, and she asked me, does this make me look fat? He goes, whoa, 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 uncool. No, not even answering the question. Next, I didn't even hear it, I'm just walking away. Okay, because he didn't want to get into it. Okay, because that's a very, very manipulative question. Okay, I'll get, I'll get back to that in a second. So one of the keys, is learning how to keep your spouse's love tank full. Again, let me go back to this example. The woman who wants the faucet fixed feels that her love tank is full when the acts of service are being done, even if that's not the husband's preferred way of showing love. You see where I'm going with this? So this is, this, but this is really love, because it's not self-serving love, it's love for the benefit of the other person. What works for them? What works for them? This poor couple, and actually, when I started pointing this stuff out, I did kind of give the, uh, the wife a hard time for just not being gracious and accepting the flowers, okay? But there's a backstory to this. He had been putting off the leaky faucet. He had been putting off the leaky faucet. And she kept on feeling her love tank depleting because he kept on procrastinating. She wasn't worried about the fact that the sink was running and costing their water bill to go up for the month in the end. But she thought to myself, $10? Hmm. That's probably what we're spending just this week alone on a leaky faucet because Mr. won't fix it. Okay, so she got this all worked out in her head. Okay, and all he had to do was wise up to who she was talking to, he was talking to. And all that he needed to do was make the adjustment and say, listen, I'd prefer to give her flowers, but that's not how she feels loved. I'll give you another example. Some men are very skittish about holding hands with their spouse in public. Okay? They just, I don't know what it is. Okay? You have like eight kids. Okay, clearly you've been busy. Okay, and for some reason holding hands in public is like this very offensive thing to them. Like they have cooties. Okay, you know, it's like, this is before COVID. Okay, like no, it's not sanitary. Um, okay, like we live together, what, like, what are you talking about, okay? So we have eight kids, but you won't hold hands with me in public. Okay, so, you know, let's say the missus likes to hold hands. So I tell the husband, hold your dumb hand. And she says, but, but, no, but nothing. Would it kill you to do that with a cheerful attitude? No, I just don't like it. No, take the eye out of it. Remember suffering? Okay. There is no I in team. He goes, I know, Father, but there is a me. And I said, yeah, quit playing games with me. Hold her hand. She wants to hold hands walking into the movies. Hold her hand. Of course, I always laugh when Catholics genuflect in the movie theater. I do it all the time. It's, I don't know, it's just conditioning, you know, have rows, aisles, ushers. Okay. I do that all the time. Okay, a little side note. Okay. Now, so every spouse, if you look at the third paragraph there, um, or actually, I guess the second paragraph, learning your spouse's love language is key to keeping their love tank full. It is more rare that the couple speaks the same love language. It is really rare. It's very rare that both of you have identical love languages, loving and receiving. Very rare. I rarely run into that. More often than not, everybody speaks different languages. 
And being better in your marriage is actually learning to speak their love language. Okay? Now, if you're unsure of what your love language is, one of the best ways to know what something is is knowing what it's not. So just look at that list of five and just think about that for a moment. Okay? Maybe you don't know what yours is, but there are, I bet you it's at least one or two on there that you're like, no, I am not a gift giver. Okay? Or that just takes too much effort, or, or I, I am not into physical touch. I'm the guy who doesn't like to hold hands with the missus. Okay? Or maybe, you know what, um, you know, quality time isn't just my cup of tea. I know after a long day of work, the last thing I want to do is listen to more problems or what's going on at home or how her day went. I just want to grab a beer and watch ESPN. Okay? But see, that's where, that's where you start to mature. Because you say, you know, I know what I want to do. I know what I prefer to do. I mean, it doesn't take the rocket science to know what I prefer to do. Okay? But if I'm going to be an adult, if I'm going to actually love maturely, then I have to do it in such a way that builds up the home, that builds up the marriage. Okay? Some people are very good at this, and other people fail miserably and repeatedly. So again, if you go to the next paragraph, every spouse has a need to feel loved by the other. And when that's not happening, trouble lurks. That's why learning your spouse's love language while becoming more aware of your own, again, how do you like to show and how do you prefer to receive love is crucial. Okay, and again, I already mentioned this example, the man who brings his wife flowers but gets rejected. Okay, it's, it was a shar and shame. I mean, I look, I know the reaction that practically all of you had in this room when I said that she said in response to the flowers, why are you wasting money? People are like, oh. okay. But I believe you me, that's not an uncommon reaction when there's been a backstory that's been percolating, right? And it's just this weeks, sometimes months, in some cases years of just pent up frustration. And then, you know, this is one of those moments where they said, we need to talk to somebody. Okay. So again, it's really funny because this whole system, I don't think is very complex. I don't think it's very, you know, I don't think it's particularly sophisticated, but I think that's sort of part of its genius and that it's simple enough pretty much for anyone to apprehend. But I would recommend that, you know, you should take time to think through these love languages and consider your own, because remember you have two, the way you like to give and the, like the way you receive. Think about the other person. The key, I think, is finding the common ground. If there is a common ground that you both speak the same language, okay, good, you can start there. But even if there's not, you know, moving outside of yourself is really what the key is. So look at that next paragraph. The key move in marriage is moving from the initial emotional love, which tends to be obsessive, into a more rational and volitional love that mirrors the cross. The object of married love is to will the good of the other as other. That's actually Thomas Aquinas' definition of charity. Willing the good of the other as other. Meaning, this self-disinterestedly. I don't love the other person because it benefits me. I love the other person for the sake of loving them because the act of loving them is its own reward. Okay? That's willing the good of the other as other. And isn't that, in fact, the mirror of the cross? Jesus did not love us until the end because it felt good or that he, it was, he was getting anything out of it. You know, it's a great paradox of calling it Good Friday. It was good for everyone but Jesus. Right? Okay, so this is the mirror of the cross, is that you don't love the other person just because you get a reward for doing that if only the reward is the fact that just loving them is already its own reward. Okay, now, in our fallen state, right, we want the feedback, right? I mean, we want to know that the sacrifices that we're making are being appreciated. Of course we do, okay? But it's interesting because Jesus chose to love us, and while that was happening in its ultimate form on the cross, 
There wasn't a single person except for the Blessed Mother Mary Magdalene St. John and the Holy Women of Jerusalem who were validating what he was doing, horrible as it was for them to watch. And Jesus is hanging on the cross already well aware in his divine mind of all the sins of the world he was dying for, past, present, and future. And even more compelling about his love is that knowing that the vast majority of people, for the vast majority of people, his love on the cross would mean nothing. Not because his sacrifice was incomplete or perfect, but because the human family, individuals, would still reject him in spite of all the love he was pouring out on the cross, he still did it anyway. See, only God can love like that. Because, you see, if we were put to that test and you were told in advance, you are going to have to lay it all on the line, but guess what? Most of the people for whom you're laying it on the line for will not want it. And they will choose, in fact, the opposite. Some of them deliberately. Not just out of weakness, but out of malice. Would you? We wouldn't. We're not wired that way. Original sin has clouded our, our, our intellects. Right? We have concupiscence, disordered desires. We don't love purely like the Lord does. Okay? That's what married love is actually trying to condition us um, to love like. Okay. So, the object of married love is to will the good of the other as other so as to help them become a saint while working out your own salvation. Again, the object of love is not to manipulate the other to do what you want for them. It's actually, that becomes a transactional relationship. Right? So, just recently I was with a friend and it was very clear that the gift that she gave me was a quid pro quo gift. So it was a gift with strings attached. It wasn't a gift. It was a token to manipulate my time. And I realized it based on some comments she made after the fact. And I was thinking to myself, I almost wanted to give it back and say, you know what? You can have your token of manipulation. I don't want it. I don't need it because you're, you're leveraging this to bargain for my time or my attention. Okay, I won't be bought like that. Okay? And this is, by the way, one of the great, great challenges in marriages, right? that love is given with impure motives. Okay? So, you know, I mean, the most immediate thing that women can think of in terms of husbands, as long as I keep him happy in the physical touch department, I get to have the new kitchen. Oh, you think that's a brazen example? It's very true, right? Or as long as I do X, Y, and Z, okay, I get, okay. So it all starts to become transactional. Okay, and this is what happens. So when the transactions start running out or the cost benefit gets too costly for one of the spouses in the relationship, and so the love has become not love, willing the good of the other as other, but manipulative and transactional, that is usually a sure road to disaster. That's a train wreck waiting to happen. So all you're waiting for is an instance or an incident which gives one of the spouses an opportunity to have a reason to start moving in the other direction. So no longer are the spouses moving together. No longer are they complementing each other. They're actually entering into a contractual transactional relationship. Okay. And just for those of you who know, I mean, um, unfortunately, um, I mean, we all know the Divorce rate is immense in the U.S. I think it's 55% of marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. So, you know, when a couple comes in for marriage prep to me, I do like to give them some sobering statistics. For instance, chances are this is not going to work out. Congratulations. Welcome to marriage. Statistically speaking, you're going to fail. Still want to do this? Okay, and they're like, what do you mean? That's not going to be us. Oh. That's what they all say, right? 
I did annulment work in the tribunal for a decade in this diocese. Nobody thought it was going to be them. Okay? So you begin to see the pieces unravel because what happens is that they, the couple doesn't take the steps from the initial emotional sort of romantic phase into the hard daily grind and the death to the ego. It's funny, my, one of my, my closest relative is my, um, my cousin, uh, Toby. He's a physician in Manila. And um, he, I think, I, I mean, I, actually I know at a certain point in his life, he was very, um, uh, very much interested in discerning a vocation to the priesthood. And he actually took some time to do that, but um, he has three children, so that, that didn't happen. But, um, and so, I asked him about two years into his marriage, when the honeymoon had kind of began to war wear off, I said, how are things going? And uh, he, um, he started tearing up. I said, oh, that great, huh? And he says, yeah, in a weird way. And I said, oh, yeah? He goes, tell me more. I knew what he was going to say. He says, nothing has chipped away at my ego than marriage. Nothing has chipped away. But you know what? I wanted it this way. I, I committed myself to loving her, knowing that it was going to chip away at my ego. I said, you're a smart guy. You, knew it, you, know, you went into it knowing, he goes, yep, suffering. He goes, but I love it. I love it. It's, a suffer it's, like, it's like the love. I, I, love do I love loving this way because it's actually chipping away at my ego. He goes, I just discovered in marriage very early on what a selfish person I really am. It's really taught me how selfish I am that I always was so accustomed to thinking of myself first, but then suddenly I had to realize, you know, I, that's just not a... Or my other, one of my other closest friends, I'll, I'll never forget this, my, my closest friend has an impressive resume. He, uh, we both went to Virginia. He uh, went to the Wharton School of Business. Uh, he worked for Bain and Company, which is, if those of you who don't know, there's a huge management consulting firm. I mean, he, only, and he has his own boutique consulting firm. And I think he probably pulls in like $2 million a year net Okay, he's only 47. It's really funny though, because one day I was with him in Lowe's and he was shopping a sale on a gas grill. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy makes $2 million a year and we're shopping a sale on a gas grill, right? So he asked the guy, is it extra to put it together for you guys to put it together? Oh yes, sir, that's $75 to put it together. Uh, okay, right? So he says, give me one second, Padre. And he steps off to the side. I can hear him talking to his wife. Yeah, it's on sale. It's on sale. We, we good? We good? What do you think? You want to think about it? The sale ends today, so if, you know, I have to go back home and then come back, and you know, we've, got, we've got my God here. So, and he goes, but he'll help me carry it in. right? And I thought to myself, this is amazing. I mean, this guy is like you know, consulting, giving advice to CEOs of five, Fortune 500 companies. And he didn't need permission, per se, to do the gas grill, but he said, I didn't want to make the decision because we both are going to be using the gas grill, so I wanted to make sure she was cool with what I was buying because she's going to be standing in front of it, too. And we wanted it to be safe for our kids, you know, and all that stuff. Okay. And I myself, that's a very thoughtful man, right? Because he could have just said, yep, I'll take two of them, one by the pool and one on the other patio. And yeah, have them both installed. And uh, is it expedited delivery by tomorrow? Sure, another hundred dollars, no problem. Do it. He could have just done that, but no, he he's, you know he actually stepped aside, right? And I, I thought to myself, wow, this is really carving away at your ego. And he goes, oh, believe you me, believe you me. Okay, but I mean, it's it's refreshing to hear stories like that and to see that that kind of example, right? Because you can tell they they understand how this is formative and shaping. Okay. So you can see, this is not completing him, she's complimenting him, because she's forcing out of him to move outside of his narcissistic, egocentric self, his own words, okay? And she's doing a great job of it, okay? Gently, okay, and with great charity. Okay, now, let me just give some final caveats here, because I'm almost getting close to time. All right, number one, Modeling what your parents did for each other may not be your primary love language, per se. You are you, and your parents are your parents. But I would say this, it's worth considering your parents' love languages. Think about your parents. 
Okay? I mean, the, word, the, 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 the idea of a love language may be completely foreign to them, but it shouldn't be. I mean, it's, it seems simple enough. Think about your parents, because believe it or not, more than likely, I mean, most people in marriage model what they know. And what they know is usually what they learned from their parents or their grandparents. Okay? And by the way, as we know, and again, I'm speaking as a child of divorcees, this is what's so hard about the divorce culture, is because the place where all the modeling is supposed to be happening, so people get a picture of what this is supposed to look like when it's their turn, and it gets blown up in divorce, okay? it just makes it so much harder for that modeling to occur. The second thing is learning your spouse's love language may not come naturally to you. It requires more of that rational and volitional love, not the emotional kind. This is where you really begin to mature. When you begin keeping your spouse's love tank full, even though it's not your preferred way of showing love, that's when you're really in the money. Okay, that's when you're really making progress. Okay, and that's when you're really, and you know, actually it's really funny because I think this is a great conversation for spouses to have with one another because the reason is, is remember St. Paul says, anticipate each other in showing love. It's one of my favorite Pauline lines, okay? I'm not saying that Paul had the love languages in mind, but the idea is that if you're having a, a conscientious discussion with your spouse, you can already anticipate saying, you know what, I know he's not a gift giver, and he knows I love receiving gifts. So this is even more special because I know he's doing this, not because he's comfortable doing it, but because he knows I feel most loved when I receive gifts. You see, so this is anticipating each other and showing love. Okay, number three, it's a real art to love your spouse in a way that keeps their love tank full, to learn their love language. And again, I've said this before, it prevents, it moves you away from self-serving love, the love, usually the love language you like to speak, into a love that is really given in favor of your spouse. Okay. As a final thought, um, I just put this forward. Um, during, I think, her acceptance of the nomination for the bench, um, Amy, Amy, Amy Coney Barrett um, talked about her husband, Jesse, who is himself a very successful attorney. Granted, not a jurist like Amy Coney Barrett, it'd be pretty hard to top that in terms of the legal profession. But um, she said in her acceptance speech, and it really resonated with me, that for how many years that they have been married, he asks her every morning, what can I do today to make the road easier for you? That's a beautiful, that's, that's not self-serving love. What can I do today to make the road easier for you? Now, Here's a caveat, and I'll end with this for the ladies. Ladies, do not expect your husbands to intuitively know. Oh my gosh. How many towels have I bitten in my office? He should just know. No. That's not true. He should just know. No. You know how old that problem is? Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. That's how old that problem is. He should just know. No. Sorry. Wrong. Right, guys? Come on, give me some love, guys. Yeah, that's right. He should just know. No. Tell him what keeps your love tank full. Have the conversation. It's not romantic. Oh, please. Please. Okay, I see enough people here of many years in marriage. Get over that already, for crying out loud, okay? You've been through too much for this. It's not romantic. Oh, spare me, okay? All right, so have, that's a conversation you need to have because if you're just expecting him to intuit and then he's not delivering on the expectation, oh my gosh. This, you, you are setting yourselves up for so much unnecessary angst. Look, do we not live in an age of perhaps of over-transparency? and honesty. I think this all started with Jerry Springer, unfortunately. Okay, but it's morphed into, oh, so much more. I mean, less, but more. Okay. Have the conversation. Talk about it. Now, there's one last caveat I didn't mention. I didn't put on here, but I will mention here. Some of you may be in marriages where this is hard to do. 
Just maybe. Okay, they're just, it's not a conversation they want to have. It's not something they're attuned to. The person just might be very comfortable in their lane where they are in the marriage. And you're just kind of struggling along. Okay? I mean, this is where I think some assertiveness is necessary. Because, I mean, you don't want your marriage simply to be like, well, I survived. You know, it's actually intended to be the arena where you flourish, right? I mean, married love is intended for human flourishing. That's what it's intended for, okay? I mean, it's really the, the primordial community in the human family where human flourishing is supposed to take place. But, you know, if people are too comfortable in their lane and they're not willing to have those difficult conversations or to talk about more difficult topics that are really uncomfortable to them, you know, or, well, you know, he just doesn't like to share his feelings. Actually, I don't know if you've mentioned, no, no, notice you've mentioned, uh, you, if you notice this this evening, I haven't talked about feelings once. This has nothing to do with your feelings. These are just object, these are love languages. You know, when I speak about Italian or Spanish or Filipino or English languages I speak, I don't get emotional in them at all. In fact, I get emotional in them because I get sad because of how many of them I've had to learn by force. Okay? But it didn't stop me from doing it. You just had to do it. So I, I would say the same thing. You just got to do it. And you just have to have the conversation. Now, if that's difficult to come by, well, okay. Um, then you're going to have to be more creative. But in general, generally speaking, um, this is, I think, a system that can be very, very helpful and powerful for couples, um, especially to if you're a couple that feels like you need some renewal and regeneration in your, in your relationship, right? Or you've been together for many years, and now you're looking forward to, you know, the better number of years you've been together are now past. And now you're looking at, you know, don't you want to make the best of them? I mean, don't you want these to be like, you know, save the best for last, right? I mean, don't you want these to be like your best and finest years, right? I mean, to me, one of the most beautiful things is to see, I mean, and I don't mean this in the beautiful, like in a sadistic way, but when I do the funeral of an elderly person and there's a widow or a widow who remains and they are really grieving, I mean, it's sad, but it's also very beautiful because you can tell they really love them, right? That's a beautiful thing. I mean, it, it's paradoxically sad and, 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 and beautiful at the same time. Because, you know, I have been the celebrant at funerals where I think the family was relieved that the person was dead. Especially the spouse. In fact, I've been in funerals like that where they were really happy they were gone. And you think to myself, oh, that's, so, that's sad. I mean, that, that's even sadness on top of the sadness of death. Right? I mean, and the death's always sad to begin with. That's a given. But to actually see family members, and especially spouses, be glad. And I don't mean because they're relieved because the suffering is over. That's not what I mean. I mean they're really glad they're dead. And it couldn't have happened sooner. Okay? And I've done many a funeral like that. And I just wonder, what was going on all those years? I mean, that was not a relationship that was flourishing. And I often wonder, you know, that they stayed together all these years, but the person who's left behind is deeply embittered. They have not flourished in their life, okay? The, their marriage actually ended up becoming not just a cross onto victory, but actually just crushed them, that they were completely obliterated, I mean, decimated. And so they, they you know, they, they go on with the rest of their life very bitter about how their life has gone, okay? I don't want that for anybody, but I especially don't want that for couples who are, tr who are trying to live a Catholic marriage, okay, or aspire to um, in the future. Okay, I will stop there because I promised an hour and I'm at 55 minutes, so I always keep my promises, okay? Any questions? Great, have a good night. <laughs> yes, sir, I'll repeat the question, so don't worry because I know the, the people in the peanut gallery want me to repeat the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Okay, uh, gentlemen brings up the whole area of expectations. 
And then he's referencing the example I brought up about the man who brought in the roses, and she said, why are you wasting money? Remember the example I used? Okay, and then, you know, this is a good point. Um, what kind of reasonable expectations could she have had of him because maybe he wasn't able to fix it or he didn't want to pay the plumber, because you know how much they charge, okay, to, pay, to fix it, right? Okay, so, but I mean, let's just take your question writ large about expectations, okay. This is actually a very, very um, important dimension of human relationships in general, but it can apply here, certainly. Um, and I can speak to you about expectations from a, um, from a seminary formator point of view, but also from a marriage point of view, not, not because I'm married, but just because I've seen it. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that one of the greatest relationship killers is having unreasonable expectations of another person. And that's not just true of marriage, by the way. Okay, and I'll give you an example. I'm an instructor, and I have students Sim simply, as we say in Spanish, no tiene la capacidad. He does not have the capacity. So I cannot put him in a situation where he's doomed to fail. Now, are there minimal standards he needs to be able to reach in order to complete coursework? Yeah. And if you can't complete the coursework, I'm sorry, but we're, I mean, I can't, I can't bend the rules backwards so much that the, the standard no longer exists, okay? But this is actually true of most things in life. You have to ask yourself if the person from whom you have expectations actually has the capacity to fulfill them. I'll give another example. In high school, I played basketball. I was a point guard. I used to get chewed out by the coach. This is at Ireton. I used to get chewed out by the coach because I would pass the ball to one of my teammates who we knew, once he caught it, was gonna create a turnover. He said, what kind of expectations do you think you have of that guy? He's not gonna be able to handle that pass. And I said, so what coach, don't pass it? Don't pass the ball to him. Not then, find another way. Okay, but this is a great metaphor for life. We have to, when we're dealing with people, we have to be able to measure what we think they're capable of doing. And we have to play within the parameters of what they're capable of doing. Now, there's two sides of that, though. Some people are incapable simply because they're incapable. Other people are incapable because they're stubbornly unwilling to bend. That's a problem. That's a problem in life. I mean, hello, anyone in the workforce ever encountered that at work? People who don't have the capacity, they have the capacity, they're just lazy or they're not interested, or they'll figure someone else will do it. I mean, we all run into this all the time, but isn't this sort of managing through life? We have to be able to put the people around us in the best possible position for success. And that's what I would also say too, would accompany the love languages. So as you're assessing your spouse's love languages, love languages and your love languages, right? Be, you have to be brutally honest about this because for instance, you may want acts of service, like the woman who wants a faucet fixed, but Mr. can't do that. In fact, past history has shown that his attempts to actually fix the faucet causes more problems in the kitchen, and now the dishwasher doesn't work either. Okay, so what was a bad situation is now hor horrible. Okay, now the hot water doesn't work, and now no one can get a warm shower. And it's February. Oh, que bellissimo, how wonderful. Right? Okay, so managing expectations is a big thing, but you have to also be able to discern whether or not people are not meeting expectations simply because they're stubbornly unwilling or lazy. And that's a, hard, that's a, that's a much more difficult conversation to have, so point well taken. Other questions? Okay, you're not gonna make me work for my money tonight, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, question is, what um, are some guidelines for picking, uh, discerning out a child's love language? Well, it depends how old the child is, right? Okay, teenagers is one thing, but young adults is another. Adult children, I mean, older than young adults is different, right? I mean, people are at different stages of life, so we can't just say one. 
Um, this is the most difficult thing with teenagers, right? They're trying to figure themselves out. Okay, so what I would say is, I mean, this is not a bad thing to introduce to them because I think teenagers intuitively could probably have this conversation and say, yeah, I think if I had to choose the way I like my number, my dominant way of showing love. Now, you might be able to figure that out, just observing them. You might say, you know, my daughter, my teenage daughter, boy, you know, when someone's down or her, one of her friends is having a hard time, she's so good about calling them up and trying to cheer them up. That's words of affirmation. It could also be quality time, because as we know, teenage girls spend a lot of time, yeah, it's this part of the deal, right? Okay. So you should be able to observe that on some level. But remember, I think there's some fluidity to this. You know, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Um, this is, I mean, I'm really perturbed by this, but the number of people I've met who really liked no human communication during COVID. I, I, I mean, let me expand that more. How many people, I don't know if you've come into this, I run into this a lot. COVID was the best thing that happened for me. I said, okay. I said, why? I don't like people. I just don't like people. That's sad. That's sad. That's not human, by the way, right? Because if we're made in the image and likeness of God and God ad intra, within himself is the primordial community of persons, the Trinity. Hello, where are we tonight? Our Lady of the right? Most Holy Trinity? Okay. Um, so if human communion is mirroring God ad intra and you are a person who generally does not like other people, you need to find the right people. Maybe that's the problem. Okay, because you should be able to like somebody. Okay, and if you don't, then you've got a lot of other big problems too. And generally speaking, the people I've talked to have told me this probably have other problems as well. That, that, that was just symptomatic of their deeper problems. Okay, but to get back to your question, I think there might be some fluidity in how this developed because, you know, they're going to, I mean, you know, these, these years that they're in right now, I mean, you know, the next three, four, five, six, seven years, I mean, this is a remarkable thing, right? Um, just think about it in terms of the life of the church. So at best, most Catholic young adults on par have an eighth grade knowledge of the faith, and that's being really generous. Okay, I mean, to, for me, it's fifth grade, but whatever, okay? So what happens since the sixth grade? Well, you have three years to high school, then another four years of college. That's 11 years right there that have gone by some of the most important years. And during this entire stretch of time, they have little to no contact with their faith, the church. And then they show up one day, hi, Father, we'd like to get married in the church. Ooh. Do we have a remedial course? This is what you missed. And just roll out this huge scroll. Okay? So there's a, te there's a huge, there's a, there's a tremendous, like, trajectory of their development that's going to basically in these next years. So to me, introducing these ideas to teenagers is perfectly reasonable, and then just leave it open with asterisks all over the place to be determined. Because I do know people who once upon a time were very, I would say, into human community and connecting with people, and then they eventually become the people I'm talking about who really like COVID because they didn't have to deal with anyone. Okay, so you can see how thing, things can, can go sideways real quick in life as we know. Okay, but um, I think it's a great idea, as if I can give you any advice on this, is yeah, introduce this to your teenagers and just see what they have to say about it. Because it, at the very least, it's planting a seed. Because I think it's also really wonderful as a tool to, for future discernment of spouses. Because if you're dating someone seriously and you begin to say, you know, what's their, what are their love languages? Okay, and if the, that's not a love language I really feel I can speak fluently or learn to do, okay, well maybe you need to think that through a little bit because you, you might be setting yourself up knowingly for some hard times ahead. I mean, marriage as it is is already hard, you know, so 
i.e. the examples of my friends who let, are letting marriage chip away at their narcissism, self, narcissistic self-absorption. Okay, so I don't know if that gives a little bit. I would introduce it to them. As early as, as early as high school, it's fine. You know, okay. Just tell them to lay off on the physical touch. Okay, yeah. John Fitz. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So the question would be is, if your primary love language is physical touch, does that also translate into it to being your primary love language of reception? Could be. I don't have, you know, John's asking, are there, uh, what percentage of people have both the same loving and receiving love language? I don't know. I don't know. And I've never seen stats on that. But I would just say, in, anecdotally, just talking to people about this topic over the years, I mean, I've given this talk several times in different places, in both coasts and in between. Um, when people take a really hard look at themselves, I rarely have met someone who's, you know, the way they like to show is also the way they like to receive, okay? I mean, that's a dominant, okay? But it's possible, so, you know, I mean, an, an easy one would be physical touch. So a person who's a hugger, okay, and that's how they feel loved, okay, likes to receive hugs. I can see that, sure. I mean, most, most huggers usually are equal opportunity offenders. Okay, right? I mean, you know, because, I mean, it's a weird thing for a hugger to be like this, when someone hugs, right? I mean, you know. Now, the other thing too, you have to, the other matrix you have to cut through too is also cultural norms, right? Because like as a Latino or as a Filipino, if you do this, that's bad. No, no, no dead fish. Can't do that. Okay, that's not good. Okay, because that, that, that's a really affront to your family. Like, what's the matter with you? You know, so, you know, it's rare that I meet a Latino or a Filipino who's um, in Filipino, we call this marambing, someone who's very touchy, very, very warm, very convivial, okay? So, um, or you would say, like in Spanish, cariñoso, very caring and loving and warm, right? Okay. It's, it's, so it's hard, part of this is cult, cross-cultural, too. You, I, I think you have to discern that out. Now, I don't know if there's some people who are fake marambing or fake cariñoso, because they just have to kind of do that to make, to make a go of it in their family. I don't know, okay? So it's like, you know, fake news, Fake love language. It's a fake love language. Okay, I, I don't know. Okay, but it's a fair question. But again, physical touch is an easy one because I don't know many people who are huggers who don't like to be hugged. So that would be that would be an easy example. That's you. You like to hug? Really? Oh, well, okay. Later on, bring it in. <laughs> right. Let's hug it out. Yes, ma'am. Do people ever? Yes. Do people ever change? Oh, that's a, that, is, that is axiomatic, yes. Like, remember the person I told you who like, used to like people and now love COVID? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, they, 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 they yeah, I mean, <clears throat> here's the thing. Not, not everybody is wired for the same type of intimacy and communion that perhaps, you know, I mean, we all have different, there's a spectrum of that, okay? I think, being a fair, reasonable, mature person is just sort of being respectful of boundaries, but yet always living with the conviction that we are all wired for communion. I mean, this is why, for instance, you know, one of the worst ways you can suffer as an incarcerated person is in solitary confinement. I mean, if you ever have read psychological studies of people who've been in solitary confinement, I mean, just the damage to their psyche is just so... I mean, you can imagine that, right? I mean, even if, you, if, if you're an introvert, and you're okay, but there's a limit to that. Because at the end of the day, we're still built for communion, right? You know, and if, if you want to take it you know, a step further, like if you take John Paul II's theology of the body, right? I mean, the, the body itself already expresses a nuptiality. 
okay? So it means communion with others, okay? But do people change? Yeah, yeah, too. And, and by the way, one of the things that changes people in marriage, for instance, is um, learning new love languages because you really want to, because you know it really matters. And this is one of the simple keys to a successful, flourishing relationship. Because you'll make that change because you know it helps the other better. So you, you die to your preference of giving, to adapting the love language that you have to give to your spouse because that's the one they're most prone to accept. But I just make this analogy, I mean, I had to live in other countries and I had to learn their language. You know, I mean, I've always found it weird that in this country we don't really force that on very strong, but okay. I had to go to other countries as an immigrant and learn the other language. And if I didn't, well, you just don't, and there are limits to where you can go in that country, how much you can enjoy the culture and also economic educational opportunities. And I also noticed living in those other countries, if you speak the local language, you get very different treatment. Even if they, and they know right away you're not a native speaker, but the fact that you're making the effort, they respond to that. They appreciate the effort because they know you're trying. And it's cool that your accent isn't perfect, it's fine, no big deal. I lived in Rome for four years. I went down the street a month ago when I was there and I said, buongiorno, and I thought that sounded authentic. I said, oh, you're American. I was like, whoa, what? You know, like it was so humbling. I was like, what? Like, wow, four years, I still don't have buongiorno correct. You know, ah, Americano. Oh, okay, all right, okay. So yes, do people change? Yes, absolutely. And that's okay, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's part of our development. And um, I think change is a good thing. I mean, <laughs> there are lots of things in us that really should change. So, you know, hopefully the good stuff sticks and the stuff that's not so good, you know, kind of gets worked out. And I think part of the mystery of married love is being able to play within the parameters of what that is in the other person and yourself and kind of making that walk together, right? With a, with a, with a, with a a priori, love in favor of the other as other, willing the, their good of the other as other, right? And if you're not willing to do that, then, well, then I wouldn't say you really have a very solid marriage, maybe not even really a true marriage. Okay, that's a pretty fundamental thing. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What do I mean by quality time? What does that mean? Um, well, <clears throat> I don't know how much I can develop that other than the fact that, I mean, I mean you can read the Chapman thing. It, normally speaking, what he's talking about is basically an availability. Like you're not too busy for them. In other words, like, okay, look, we all have these people at, at the office. The one who drops by your cube and plops out in your seat. Okay, you're trying to get work done and they're just, you know, okay. Now, there are appropriate boundaries that we have to set sometimes, like close the door. Okay, because you gotta get some stuff done. Like you have a hard deadline you're trying to meet, and to just today is not today. And you might have to tell them very politely, say, hey, listen, can we chat later? I'm under the gun. You know, and if you work on the same team, they should probably be under the gun too. I've always wondered about that, but anyway. Um, so, but it's in a, basically an availability. You know, it's, it's this willingness to, to be open. Like, you know, like you, you see them and you're willing to talk to them, but you don't see them and run the other way. It's really bad, especially when they see it, you know. So th there's this sense that you're actually not just spending the minutes, hours. Because it, it doesn't necessarily, to me, translate as just amount of time, okay? But the fact that you were available to actually engage them can make them feel very loved. Because especially if they know you're a really busy person and yet you weren't too busy for them. Okay? It's especially meaningful when you're dealing with people who have huge demands on their time. I'll give you an example. You have a mother of eight kids running, it's just, you know, organized chaos, right? So, and you know, you just think they just don't have time to talk to me. And yet somehow they do, right? Like, they'll just tell the oldest, you gotta watch the rest of them, I'm going out to, for coffee with Christina. Remarkable, remarkable. I have friends like that, really remarkable. 
Okay. So I think that's even more heroic because you're making yourself available. Because they, they perceive in the other person a real need for communion, and they know that maybe that person doesn't have anyone else with whom to talk. Or maybe you and that person have such a very close shared experience that only you would understand the context, right? I mean, I find this especially true in the priesthood. I mean, I, look, I have a lot of good lay friends, great. But there are, some, there, there are a lot of things in priestly life that only other priests understand. And that's, I mean, you would, you would expect that, okay? And, and so I have, to ha I have a short list of like three priests that I can call if I need to talk to somebody. So, and I, because I know they'll respond. Okay, so, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Other questions? It's free, I don't charge. Okay, oh, yes, okay. Go ahead, please. What advice? How young are they? What advice do I have for figuring out the love languages of your brothers? Are they older or younger? Okay. And I would apply the same principles I had applied to the question about the teenagers, right? In the sense that you could probably figure it out, but it'd be a fun conversation to have with them, if you can or they want to have the conversation. But you know what, listen, when you live with people, you know, right? You know. Listen, I mean, I, you know, I, I live in a community. I, I can tell you the four faculty members I deal with most closely. One, if I give him scotch. Good. The other one, if I take him to the airport. Okay. The other one, if I listen to him because he's having problems back home with his family of origin, okay? And the other one, it's usually, you know, if I tell him he's doing a great job and he's, okay? So I covered four of the five right there, but it just happens to be my case. So I know, I know. Like, you know, the other guys like in the faculty, I don't have to tell them they're doing a good job. These are very, very self-confident alpha males. They don't need little Magat telling them they're doing a great job. It's like telling Michael Jordan, you're really good at basketball. <laughs> Thanks, my God. Coming from you, it means a lot. <laughs> right? All right? But you know, you know. So my, my suggestion is, one, try to figure it out yourself. And then two, if, you're, if you have a relationship with that sibling, ask them to look at these and tell, and tell them to tell you, do you think I'm right? It's a great conversation. I had this conversation recently with my sister. And she said, oh, I need some time to think about that. That is complex, okay? So she's on a flight to California, and I'm sure she's, I texted her the five love languages. I bet I can guess you're number one and number two, giving and receiving. She goes, oh yeah, so we're putting money on it. But see, I have no way of verifying she's telling me the truth or she's just gonna extort another dinner out of me. So whatever, okay. Anyway, okay. So try to guess, and if you can't guess, or, Actually, try to guess and then check your work against them. Now, if they're ornery, like brother, or younger brothers can be to older sisters, and they're just contradicting you to be spiteful, okay, well, that's a different kind of thing. Then, then they just need maturity medicine, not by love languages. Okay, all right. Other questions? No? Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, just as an announcement, so next week at this time, yep, 7 o'clock next Wednesday, I'm going to give a talk about the papacy. And... Um, I'll mention this again next week because there'll be people perhaps here next week who aren't here tonight. But just to give you a basic context of it, so um, the kind of the background, um, it, I, I've been asked to give the talk 
because there are persons who are leaders in your community, and I don't even mean the priests, um, who have observed that there are many, many persons uh, in the parish, in the community, um, and I would generally say this tends to be true in importantly large swaths of the church in the U.S., who are very troubled by Pope Francis and, and any number of things, okay, not the least of which is you know, recent decisions about the 1962 Missile Mass, okay. That's just one of the things. Okay, now, so the talk is actually to talk about the papacy by its nature, its history, and its mission, because um, I've found that many Catholics, in fact, most Catholics I know, have lived with very either A, erroneous, or B, unrealistic expectations of the Pope. And I don't mean just this Pope, I mean all Popes. So I would say that the talk probably is in the category of what I call myth busters about the papacy, okay? Because I think there's a lot of things people think about, and I'll just give you just a teaser. Okay, just a show of hands. How many of you have been taught or heard or believe that the Holy Spirit picks the next pope? That when the, when the, when the cardinals meet in conclave, the Holy Spirit picks the next pope? Okay, that's half of you. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay, and why people say that and what the church actually says about it or doesn't say about it. Okay, but many people will tell me, oh, when the Holy Father is chosen in Rome at the next conclave, the Holy Spirit picks the Pope. Interesting. Okay, see some people are like this. Okay, all right. Have a great night. See you next week. God bless.